Thanks, Ron. Really appreciate it. I'm trying to clear my mind. Zach's presentation, I was like, wow, wow, the whole time. Um, in fact, it, interestingly enough, the, there is a community down the road from the uh, waterfall that's behind me who had a email, a bomb threat was emailed into some ceremony last week. And then they found out that email is coming from Russia. Carry on with your party. Um, I'm going to be talking a little again about a little bit about New Vector. New Vector was founded in uh, 2015, uh, acquired by SUSE a little while ago. And this, these words up on my screen that I assume you can see are not just for you, they're for me. I want to remind myself that I want to make sure that you're getting what problem are we solving. Uh, New Vector is extremely focused on doing security in containerized environments. Very, you know, We'll talk very specifically uh, about Kubernetes today. I'm going to use the word Kubernetes almost like a pronoun. Uh, when I'm talking about Kubernetes, it could be, you know, AKS, EKS, and one of the, the clouds. It could be uh, OpenShift. It could be Rancher taking care of everything or some little K3S cluster on your laptop. Any uh, Kubernetes distribution is Kubernetes. And it does come with some particular challenges when we're trying to put traditional security into Kubernetes. Um, if you think about, for example, you know, the almost shadow IT or the sprawl of VMs, when you get into the, the pods and containers inside of an environment, they're coming and going. There's hundreds of them, possibly thousands inside of an environment. Um, you know, the good news about environments like Kubernetes is it gives us the opportunity to do infrastructure as code, right? So as a as say an application owner, I don't have to open a ticket and wait for uh, resources or open a ticket to the firewall people to say, poke a hole in the firewall for this application. I can bring up my infrastructure, my applications all work. And in fact, one of the interesting things about you know containerized environments like Kubernetes, if I'm a developer, this network is flat and almost even invisible. And for me, if a developer, I'm like, that's great. I deployed my applications. They can all talk to each other. We're all one big happy family here behind the firewall. You know, everybody's bad on the outside, flat on the inside. Um, and I don't have to worry about the network. Now, if I'm a security person, compliance, uh, old school network infrastructure, the sentence is like, hey, the network is very flat and you can't really see the traffic on it is absolutely terrifying, right? That's hard to do security without being able to see the network. Um, and not just the network in and out, but like a lot of the east-west configuration. Pods and containers are talking to each other. Uh, I will make an assertion, and I always thought this would be controversial when I started saying it, but everybody's nodding their heads. I'm telling you that a Kubernetes cluster, from a practical standpoint, logical standpoint, is a data center unto itself. It has its walls. It's all this infrastructure on the inside and there's an ingress and egress on the outside. So if we want to try to do actual security inside of Kubernetes, what I want to do is what I want you to want to do is try to shrink that security boundary down from, hey, we're all friends on the cluster to let's get the security boundary down around each and every workload. Uh, what I want to do is roll out zero trust as a default. And with, I want to make sure we stay pointed on what zero trust is, because I'm going to show you a little bit of that in a moment. And also, more importantly, not just looking from a network standpoint at layer three and four, right? I can't just go, oh, look, it's port 53. Clearly, that's DNS. Nobody ever lies on the internet, right? Um, and also, I want to make sure that we're striking a balance between threat-based and risk-based or zero trust approaches. What should you do? What's more important? Do them both. Defense in depth is the key here. Uh, we've heard a lot of great solutions. Should you choose all of them? Yes, you should. Um, but I want to make sure that we've got risk versus threat inside of our environment. And that we also, when we're working with a containerized environment like Kubernetes, that the solution that we're providing is generally feels very native. I don't want it to be clunky. Um, I, I, we introduced something from a security standpoint that's either harder, impossible to deploy, harder, impossible to use, or slows people down. They will just go around it. Uh, in the year of our Lord, 2024, people running in Kubernetes environments oftentimes brought them up because they wanted to get barriers out of their way. Uh, if security becomes an impediment to deployment, uh, you know, sad story, but at most organizations, they'll pick the agility over the security, but they won't admit that out loud. So from a history standpoint, a little history helps here. Remember what I said, it's if you go into a Kubernetes cluster, being able to see the network like you could in a traditional old school network where I've got switches and I can mirror a port or see what the traffic is on the wire is essentially impossible. You do get the ability to see a little bit of ingress and egress, north-south traffic in and out of the cluster. The founders of NuVector, uh, what was what, 2015, uh, one of them was from VMware, one of them was from Fortinet and Fortigate, you know, that firewall company. Uh, Gary actually wrote a lot of the deep packet inspection and data loss prevention protocols and tools 
for those firewalls. These two friends got together and said, wait, we think we can solve this problem. Kubernetes has rolled us back 30 years um, from a network standpoint, being able to do security. Long story short, they invented something called New Vector that gives you the ability to not only see that traffic, but to understand that traffic all the way through the whole OSI stack, all the way up to layer seven. Layer seven being really important because that's the application layer. That tells us what the application actually is and what it's doing. And if you're going, well, that, that sounds like something we've been doing for years with next generation firewalls. The answer is yes, it's a very good thing to do. Um, New Vector gives you, again, that whole ability to see all of the traffic. We also can see, give you the ability to see all of the processes and to do some enforcement sort of right on the wire, the virtual wire, so to speak, to actually prevent things from happening. This is not post-event correlation, like, oh, we've been under attack for the last several seconds, minutes, hours, but to say, this is not allowed inside of my environment. But we also need to make sure that this is easy. Um, New Vector gives you automated behavioral learning. It also gives you visibility you just didn't have before. Even before you get to an enforcement model, you wind up with the ability to actually understand more about what's happening in your environment from an isolated and sole source of truth. We're not just making API calls against the network or doing uh, sys calls or eBPF correlation at the end. It's very native to the environment. And in fact, what I'm gonna do here in just a moment is show you at least the first six bullet points on here. And I, hopefully, not only is, is this presentation and its content very interesting for you, if I'm going to be doing some actual live demo in here. So even if the interest of watching the nerd trip, we'll see if anything breaks while I'm trying to do a live demo while cramming an hour's worth of content into five minutes. So I first want to get out of the way exactly what we think about from Zero Trust. This is a picture of the airport. Um, I think it's Denver. It is Denver. Look, there's a Colorado sign there. So Zero trust concept is extremely easy to understand, yet people seem to get it and then they fall back off and start thinking about threats. Zero trust is just this, implicitly trust nothing, and then explicitly trust things, explicitly allow. The TSA line at the airport is a fantastic example of zero trust. Nobody is allowed through until they explicitly have a reason to come in, whether they've got a passport, they have to have a boarding pass, you have to be scanned, right? So nobody except explicitly anybody. And that's how that works. It's a secure perimeter. You have to pass through that with explicit permissions to do so. And from an example, I also want to say, you know, like a no-fly list at the uh, on the TSA is not zero trust. That is a threat-based drill. It's a lot about what my you know, the previous uh, speakers were talking about. Like Zach said, we're looking for threats. It's, you know, Carl, you're not allowed in this bar from the thing that you did three years ago. That's looking for a particular CVE, a threat, malware, where zero trust is looking for nothing except things that are allowed. So we're turning that blocking thing kind of upside down, nothing until something. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go to a Kubernetes cluster because I want to meet you where you are. What are we doing inside of a Kubernetes cluster? It does nothing for us until our application workloads are there. And we make an assumption that most people test their software before they deploy it. Yes, yes, we do. And there's often at least two or three phases uh, in an SDLC. We have a dev test phase and we certainly have production and maybe in the middle we have a, a QA phase. And more often than not, uh, we observe that that's actually discreetly different clusters. I'm going to use discreetly different clusters here as an example and try to stay on time. And I'm going to make sure New Vector is deployed across all of them. So New Vector is a Kubernetes native deployment for a security tool. So it's not a SaaS. It doesn't do any code injection, no sidecarring. You deploy New Vector into your environment. It takes approximately 60 seconds to deploy with a Helm chart and it's open source. Uh, that's wonderful. You can get started with this today. I happen to be on the interface right here. This is New Vector installed in one of my little pretend clusters. I called it AngelBeat Dev. This is my dev test cluster. And while we can certainly do a lot of threat-based things and admission control, what I really want to hone in on is that zero trust part. And remember when I said earlier that, you know, containers are coming and going, it's hard to point at something and go, oh, it's this network block over here, or it's running on this node over there. So the first thing we have to do is get our arms around what those workloads are. And New Vector, I think, does a really good use of the English language. Right here in policy and groups, we have these groups. And what we do inside of the environment is every time there's a deployment in the environment, a new group is created. 
Uh, the most elementary explanation of that is sort of a crosshatch between the deployment and the namespace that it's in. So I can always say this front end to my environment is, is this container, whether I scale it from one to five, that will always be in that group. Whether if I do a rolling update of that application, it'll always land in this group. So we can say there, it is that workload. And what we do with that workload is actually create a fingerprint of the behavior of that application, test that fingerprint, and either use it for monitoring or monitoring and enforcement across the environment. And what better way, because this is kind of boring, it's a brand new cluster and not much is in it, to actually deploy, I'm gonna go try to deploy an app. This is where the live part comes in. So I'm pointed in my context at this cluster that you see here, it's a garden variety uh, Kubernetes cluster. Actually, all of my tests are run in the, across the multiple clouds here. And I'm gonna just deploy my little test application and I'll show you what this looks like in a second. So as this, this is my pretend workload, it's actually does some things inside of a namespace. While that's being deployed, if I go back to New Vector, you'll see right here, and I'm gonna sort by namespace. Just now, as I deployed that application to this cluster, New Vector knew that it was here already, even though if I go back here and I switch to that namespace so I can see what's getting deployed, here are the pods, if I know how to type, here are the pods coming in and they're just starting to get up and rolling. But you'll notice back on this New Vector interface, I've got this discover sitting here. Let me show you what it is I'm talking about because there's three modes that anything can be in any given group inside of New Vector. So not the whole cluster, we can get very granular about the workloads. The first and the default mode for New Vector is what's called discover mode. Again, great use of the English language, discover discovers. What it's doing is watching the network connections, again, the whole stack, and all the processes, and we can even monitor things like directories inside of any pod and container. And it's noting down what the behavior of that application is. And that becomes a manifest of explicit allow rules that we're going to utilize in an environment that makes the assumption that we're implicitly denying everything. Zero trust. The next mode, and I'm using the word next very loosely here because there's different ways to mix this up, is what's called monitor mode. A monitor mode ceases learning, no more learning is going on. But what it's going to do is it's going to observe all of that behavior that we talked about against that rule set of allow rules. You can write deny rules if you want, but I think a best practice is to use explicit allows. And it's going to send you, the end user, not only in the interface, but often your SIM, Datadog, Splunk, Prometheus, whatever it may be. Hey, attention human being, this rule was violated. This activity occurred and I don't have an allow list rule for this. What do you want me to do? We invented monitor, uh, generally speaking, at first to be sort of a dry run against protect mode. And you're probably already guessing what protect mode does. Protect mode does much what monitor does, but it means it this time. That shall not happen. That network connection or even a network connection, but it's like the right, not the right protocol, doesn't actually happen. The processes don't work. So monitor mode is kind of a dry run against protect. Last thing we want to do is flip a bit in production and break somebody's app accidentally because they didn't participate, right? Remember what I said earlier, they'll go, well, security's stupid. Let's keep running our apps. But the other wonderful byproduct that we learned from our end users was that monitor mode is also a fantastic way to gather data about my environment that I didn't know before. And you can mix these modes depending upon what your workload is at any time. So if I go back to, and let's let's go make sure that my app is up and running. Yeah, there's my app. And let's go see if the app is actually functioning. Oh, goody, it has a, it has a, a URL on it, or at least an IP address. We'll paste that in here. There, that's my pretend shopping cart app. And what I'm going to do is, you know, I'm going to get maybe sunglasses for everybody on the call, uh, add that to a cart, go look at maybe we need some salt and pepper shakers, do that. The exchange rate is great. I'll pay for it Canadian dollars. All this is happening. My application is running. And if I go back here and look inside of my little online boutique here, in fact, I'll even filter it down. So we're just looking at online boutique. You'll see, I'm going to click on a group. So I just clicked on was the front end group, which is the front end uh, pod container that's running this nice little pretend shopping cart store. And you'll see, oh, here, here's a pod in here. That's the front end server. There's one there's a scale of one. Again, they'll always appear here. More importantly, we'll look at, say, process profile rules. These are things that ran on the container while I was talking to you. Well, was, this happened instantly. It's quicker than it looks here because I was busy talking about it. And even the network rules. Look at this. 
Um, maybe kind of a little bit boring. Most of those are HTTP, but you'll see that new vector is going, this thing talks to this thing over this protocol anytime that that protocol has been identified. And what I have here right now on each and every group is I've already established over in whatever period of time that needs to be a fingerprint of the appropriate behavior of that application. Um, if I go, where's my, uh, where's my front end card? Right there. So if I even pop back and go look at my, let's go grab this front end container. And I'm just going to, I'm going to shell into it. And all I'm doing right here is just issuing a command, the sh command to that front end container. So I'm logging into the container live because I'm, I have a cube cuddle access to this environment. I'm root on this container and I can do things like list things, whoops, list, or say, who am I? Or I could get uh, wgetsusa.com. Uh, I can issue commands. And if I pop back over to my interface here and give it a little refresh, you'll see that in my process profile rules, everything I just did right now wound up populated on that list. Now, that might be good for my system. Or maybe I'll say, and I'm going to switch this group into monitor mode. Now, remember what those three modes are, right? Monitor mode is monitoring for violations of the rules. These are allow rules. If it's not on this list. The rule is it can't happen. So I'm going to grab this wget rule that we just learned, and I'm going to blow it away. Wget is no longer allowed in this group. And I'm going to go back over to this container and go run that wget command. I should probably call it SUSE, not sus.com. All right, there we go. It worked. Why did it work? Because we are in monitor mode. We're not enforcing the rules, we're testing them. And if I go back over to my notifications, go to my security events, you'll see, oh, there's a security event. The event is this ran in the environment, didn't stop it. And this could go off to say a Splunk dashboard or anything like that. Or I could put it into, let's say, if I filter down here, I'm gonna put this into protect mode. And you're a smart group. I'll bet you'll know exactly what's going to happen next. I'm going to try running that wget command again, and it was killed. So if I learned it and learned it the wrong way, that process was killed. This is very powerful. I can kill that thing right at the root level. I've got pseudo access inside of this environment. New vector said stop. I could also go back and learn from my notifications and my security events. So let's pretend that we were doing this in QA and we went, oh, whoops, that's really not a bad thing. This was a false positive. I, I really want to let people run wget on this container. I could, I don't have to roll back to discover mode, wait for that thing to hopefully happen again if it's a rare event. I could take the alert and use the output of the alert to just become a rule. I could deploy this alert back into it if I go to policy and groups, I'm going to just filter down to the front end. You'll see here, if I go to process profile rows, wget showed back up under user created. I made it work. I can come back in here and uh, try wget again, and it should work. Um, I can also pull this baby back into discover mode. Do it one more time because I want to make sure that the network rules were learned because I misspelled something earlier. So if I do that one more time, it runs back out to the internet. And we also learned some rules from a networking standpoint. You'll see front end was sent out to external because that just happened. I'm gonna throw this group back into protect and we'll show you how to codify this in a second. But I'm gonna go to find the network rule. There's that front end, that network rule that we just learned. I'm gonna remove that, get rid of it. We like to double confirm on this page because you know, Cutting off the network makes everybody cry. So I've gotten rid of the rule that, again, that, that explicit allow rule that allows us to communicate to the outside world that specific connection. I'm going to go back and run wget again. The command ran, right? Because we have an allow rule that I added via that error process, but it's not working. And the reason it's not working is, well, the network connection's been broken because I decided that it should be. I go back to my alerts and you'll see there is an implicit rule has been denied. What's the, what is the implicit rule? The implicit rule is no until the answer is explicitly yes. This will probably start to fill up as W, there's a third one. Wget will eventually time out and lose its mind because it can't get out the, the 
to the outside network. This is some nice defense and depth, and it creates a zero trust boundary. And it makes us be able to say to ourselves or our management or CISO or auditors, we're not really vulnerable to that vulnerability. That exploit can't be exploited here because that would be abnormal behavior inside of our environment. It wraps a nice shell of security around it. But the other really fun part is that security is code part. So I'm going to go back to my groups and I'm going to go find, you know, I'm going to sort by namespace. I'm going to go find my application stack. Now I can grab onto any one of these groups. I'm going to grab onto all of them. What I'm doing here is I'm getting my arms around. I'm selecting my whole app stack that I'm using for this frontline store. And I'm going to say, hey, I have been in discover mode. I know how my application is supposed to behave. I have a good profile of behavior for this application. And I'm going to take the profile of this behavior and I'm going to export it. I'm going to use security as code. And right here, when I do this export group policy, and yes, all of this can be done with an API. Nice. I have an option right now. I can, and I can make an assertion in the file that you're about to see, whether I want to leave each of these groups in the mode that they are, or if I want to make an assertion. So let's pretend we're going to send this. This is my dev test cluster. I've got it set up. I want to send this off to my QA cluster to go test these rules. At the same time, I'm already doing QA. This should be almost zero extra work in your environment. I could send this to GitHub. We could certainly GitOps this. I didn't plug it into this environment, but you could also GitOps this inside of your entire environment. I'm going to download this file. Why, yes, we would like to download files. I'm going to send it here. And then when that file is done, oops, there you go. This, you may recognize, is YAML, the language of the gods. What's actually here is what's called a CRD. It's a custom resource definition that allows you and me and everybody to extend the capability of Kubernetes. Now, the first thing that happens with this file, it's not necessarily the most important, but it happened right now. Those of you watching the screen went, oh, that's interesting. This is a manifest of the behavior of the application. You could take this and show it to your application owners and go, is this the way your app is supposed to behave? Yes. Cool. I wrote your security policy for you. Here you go. Ship it with your code. May I have a piece of pizza, right? Kind of peace in the land. But the real effective part, and so far I haven't broken my demo, so thank you for praying to the uh, internet gods for me. Let's go over to another cluster that I have new vector in. Go to policy groups. Oh, log me out. Glad we saved passwords. There we go. Nope, I'm going to type it this time. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually on a completely different cluster. They aren't even talking. In fact, this is running in a completely different cloud. I think that first one was on GKE. This one I think is EKS and AWS. And I've got another one I'll put in Azure to show that everything's democratized here. The interface looks the same. And if I go under my policy, you'll notice should be pretty empty. Not much here. I'm going to go back to my uh, context here. Let me get out of this thing. And I'm going to point my cube cuddle at my command line back at this QA cluster. So now I'm using this command line to send this file to this cluster. Let's do it. So I'm going to apply a file. And I happen to know what it's named because I do this. I'm going to throw this whole document at that cluster that already has new vector installed inside of it. I need to create the namespace. I found out that the word boutique is very clumsy to type. I should pick a different word. Let's try that again. There was my mistake. Passed over it now, right? Something went wrong. So while I'm sending this CRD file off to a Kubernetes cluster, again, I could apply this to, you know, I could stick this in Rancher if I wanted or whatever, whatever uh, Kubernetes infrastructure you have. I go back to this cluster and hit refresh. And Shazam, I have all of these rules that I established in the earlier cluster. Three things to notice here, and not necessarily in any particular order of importance. Not only, it's not just that they're you know, called CRD and they're colored peach, which is handy to see with our human eyes, but CRD rules in new vector get matched first. That matters because let's say we had learned some inappropriate behavior without having those rules in place. The CRD rules overwrite. Secondarily, the CRD rules, if you remember when I went into this, say the process profile rules, I'm admin on this cluster. I can't edit these rules. That chain of command over those CRD rules has to stay pure and intact. I wanna run it back through it. I could have put that in my Helm chart. I could, again, I could have checked it into code, do some pulls against it. And the other important thing, you'll notice 
I sent the security profile for this application to this cluster and I didn't even have the application sitting in there waiting for me yet. It's already ready to go already. And that actually becomes very, very easy. Um, that whole discover process that we were doing, I get a very, very popular question about this. Well, how long, Jorn, should I be in discover mode? I mean, I'm an engineer. I'm going to answer with it depends. Um, but there, there are a couple of ways to understand that. One, a, maybe a simple one is maybe my back end Redis cart. I'll notice from the, the, uh, the front end, the cart service is talking to the back end and it's using the Redis protocol. That's very elementary. Um, I can see that with my own eyes and go, that's all that should ever happen in this environment. But an even better answer to, ooh, how long should I be in discover mode is you're already doing dev test in your environment. You have an SDLC, you have some amount of time that you're testing your apps. Let New Vector go along for the ride. The amount of effort to have a New Vector be in discover mode and learn all these things about your application is right down around zero effort. You don't have to do it. It's unobtrusive. It's not in your way. It doesn't slow your environment down. Uh, if you had this in environment and your application owners would be none the wiser, or if you're the application owner, you'd start to learn really wonderful things about your environment. Um, the other good news about New Vector is the fact that, well, it is, let's get out of this. Uh, New Vector is Kubernetes native. I know that as an engineer myself, when people have events like this, talk about really cool things and I like it. I'm like, ooh, I want that. I can't shut up that voice in the back of my head that's going, how do I deploy this? Can I even deploy it? Will it ruin my environment? I'm going to lay out to you really quickly what that deployment actually looks like. Like I said, it is Kubernetes native. It installs via a Helm chart very, very quickly. Um, in fact, just for fun, let's go to my other environment that I don't even have New Vector in, and I'll show you how fast New Vector installs. So I'm I'm actually grabbing the Helm deployment. Uh, for those on the call who don't know what Helm, Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes. It's a much easier way to go, I would like this application and I wanna use the one size fits most defaults and I can change some of the defaults and automatically get an app very easily uh, inside of my application. That can be done uh, you know, certainly from the command line. So here are the, the uh, Helm charts right here, they're on, they're on GitHub, very easy to see. And in fact, the only thing that I'm going to do about the defaults here is I'm actually just making sure that the web UI for New Vector is tagged as a load balancer type because that's how I can go see it on a public uh, a, a public facing uh, cloud infrastructure like EKS, AKS, GKE. Um, if the internet's moving fast enough, we start to see this environment deploy pretty quickly. There's new vector, and it was it was not in this cluster until I did it a few seconds ago. And if I say Kubernetes Git pods, not G pods, you'll see new vectors already starting to get up and running. It usually takes about sixty seconds. What's going in this environment? It's a very you know we try to do microservices much the way we always do in Kubernetes. Uh, one of the things that gets installed is a thing called a controller. The controller is, you know, another good use of the English language, controls things. It's the brains of the operation. I drew three of these on my little kindergarten drawing in my Kubernetes cluster here very deliberately. The default deployment is three. They're active, active, active. So there's an election that happens. All of the configuration is memory resident. We don't use a database um, for the name of speed and the name of security. If one of these tips over, Kubernetes will bring the other one back up. If it's the leader, an election happens and one comes back in place, stays up and running inside of your environment. Plus there's backups and configs that stay intact. The other containers that we deploy are pods or what's called scanners. Guess what? Scanners scan. These are the things that have the ability to scan for uh, CIS benchmarks, other compliance tools, and also scan for CVEs inside of your environment. A lot of the scary stuff that Zach and the, the other speakers were talking about. We also deploy things called a, or one thing called a manager. A manager does the management. That's the interface that I was logged into. The pod has a public website. I'm able to log back into it. It's a reskinning of API commands. So it's all API at the back end. And then we install things that are called enforcers. Drew the enforcers on this screen on every single node, because that's a daemon set. There's one of them running per node, that's it. And they interact at the virtual switch. New Vector's ability to see and understand and block that network is actually patented. We asked for 10 patents. The, 
10th, the 10 out of 10 was finally granted last fall. And then as SUSE, we open sourced it. So everybody gets to use it, interact with it and test it out for free. We only make money when people you know, want to buy support for it. And if I come back to my environment, I can see New Vector is uh, done and running. Uh, I'm going to get the service and I could log right. And I'm not going to do that now because we're out of time. We could log right back into that interface and New Vector is deployed in one minute. Again, innocuous. It's not interfering with any traffic and it's busy learning everything about the applications that are inside of that environment. If you test it out and you don't like it, you just delete it. There's no code injection. There's nothing really left behind. Um, you can get from nothing to understanding a great deal about your environment in a matter of five minutes. And we've seen a lot of that from a lot of organizations. Um, we did have one, it was just a few weeks ago, they were testing, it was a large organization paying a lot of money to an extremely large uh, security company. They were testing New Vector. They wanted to have it sort of as a second thing in their Batman utility belt. And they called us two days later and said, hey, we're seeing this thing that saying it's a SQL injection attack. What is that? And we're like, it's a SQL injection attack, right? It's on the wire. Like, we don't believe it. Well, they were able to go back into New Vector, notice that they were able to do packet captures on that environment and prove to their people, look, we were under attack and our other multi-million dollar tools weren't solving that problem. And that's because New Vector is the only thing that can natively see what's happening on the wire uh, inside of a Kubernetes environment. As a, as a bit of a wrap up, I want to make sure we sort of get across the difference between uh, you know, threat matching, which you should do. Things like looking at CVEs, looking for malware, ransomware, things you've heard already on this talk, and then zero trust segmentation, right? We're going to we're going to have permit policies, process policies, file access policies that are universally allowed because we're going to deny things at the bottom. I think it's a more robust way to do security to add on to what you're already doing. I would actually lead with this. And I'd also say that you do both you're both in tandem and zero trust controls. I don't think should be something we'll do that later because it sounds advanced. Remember that list of things that your application can do is a lot shorter list of all the bad things out there in the world. Cobble them together, get them run together as, as an entire uh, suite of utilities. And we like to say there's eight layers of security you can get inside of Kubernetes. Um, they're all here and it's very easy to deploy. And it seemed like I was talking fast. I hope you were listening fast because I wanted to make sure that everybody here had a time for Q&A. Uh, Ron had time to do a bit of backup. Um, my, my parting comments, and I'm going to put these uh, inside of the chat. Uh, I'll send you some geeky reading uh, for everybody inside. Let's see, there's the everyone button. There are the links to the New Vector docs, very quick to start installing right away inside of your environment. And New Vector is in the marketplace for AWS. So that is generally a one-click installation. And that is for using what's called New Vector Prime. New Vector Prime is the um, you know, fully supported version. That's actually a one-click install and you can adopt all of your Kubernetes clusters back up inside of it to have sort of a single pane of glass for visualization inside of your environment. And Federation, even more importantly, allows you to establish security rules, either you know, permission or denying, and then rain them down all across your entire domain to the child clusters uh, inside of your environment. So my name is Jorn, uh, thus endeth my presentation because I wanna make sure we end it on time. Ron, how'd I do?